It's amazing that we have a God who can break every chain. Amen? I'm thankful for that. I have to first start off by saying welcome back to our newest newly wed couple, Mr. and Mrs. Francis. Lawrence has been a huge part of our family here, and now we are so happy to have Natalie with us. So we are glad that you guys are back and enjoying married life, I'm assuming. All right. This morning, my sermon is entitled, When God Asks You to Do Big Things. When God asks you to do big things. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to open your word. Father, we pray that as we open scripture, Lord, that Father, you will speak to our hearts and to our minds. Father, help us to be drawn closer to you. Help us not to just hear information, but Father, take that information, apply it to our lives, and change our world. Father, we thank you for your son and the sacrifice he made on the cross. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. When God asks you to do big things. If you were here last week, we talked about what made a Christian. And we talked about serving within the area that God has gifted you. We talked about behaving like a Christian. We talked about what it is to have your, remi- your mind renewed, as in Romans 12, where it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so here's what happens, is once you submit to the will of God, you have to be ready to hang on because God is going to use you. Amen? Amen? So if we're submitting to the will of God, then the next logical step is that God is going to do something with those who are submitted to his will. So it's not a matter of if, but when God asks you to do big things. Now, there are, there's a statement that I've always had some trouble with. And that is that some are born to greatness, while others have greatness thrust upon them. Anybody ever heard that statement before? You know, I've I've heard that over and over again in several different places, and I thought about that, and I kind of have a problem with that. Because I can agree with it, and I can disagree with it. I can agree with it because I have found some people that just tend to ooze greatness. I mean, it just seems like everything that they do just seems to work. Everything seems to go right. I literally had a friend that I believed that if he was broke and he was to go out and dig a hole in his backyard, he would strike oil. Everything just seemed to work for him. And the reason I can disagree with that statement is because for me, it's the exact opposite. If there's a difficult way to do something, that is the way that I'm going to do it. If there's a complicated way to do it, that's the way that I've set my mind that it's going to happen. So where others may ooze this greatness out of them, I struggle for every drop that there is. You know, that's why I love the Bible. Because when I read this book, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged because there's a lot of messed up people in the Bible. There's a lot of people with problems, with issues. 
there's a lot of people who had greatness thrust upon them. But here's what I love. I love the fact that God uses everyday people, ordinary people, to do incredible things. So I believe that greatness is not something you're born with. But I do believe that greatness is thrust upon us when we choose to walk in accordance to God's will. I once had somebody say to me, when you submit your life fully to the Lord, hang on. Because God is going to use you. And so this morning, as we're talking about the idea and the concept of what do you do when God asks you to do big things? You know, I will tell you, I believe that we're in the last days. And I've heard Adventist preachers say this for the last 20 or 30 years. Some of you have heard this longer and longer. But even science today is saying that our world is in a decline. And that if something doesn't change, we're going to be in trouble in not that very long. And so, I believe that as this world comes to its ultimate close that God is going to have us be doing greater and greater things for the gospel. That God is going to require more out of his church members than just sitting in a pew, listening to a sermon, going home and having Sabbath afternoon lay activities. And so as I, I, I see this, I see that we're going to be faced more and more with this choice Of God asking us to do big things. Things that we're not comfortable with. Things that scare us. I once had somebody say to me, if your dream doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. If your dream doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. So this morning, I want to do something that I can say now, having the first service... I've only done twice in my life before. And that is, I want to preach on an entire book of the Bible. And I'm going to do that in under 22 minutes. So, how did in the world do that? Well, number one, I picked a very short book. <laughs> All right? That helps. <laughs> Number two, I'm going to hit the highlights, the cliff note version, the one the teacher didn't ever want you to read because it gave everything away without actually having to read the book, okay? It's the cliff notes version, but at the same time, I want you to go home and I want you to read the entire book. The entire book takes about an hour to read if you're a slow reader. If you're a fast reader, I read it last night in about 16 minutes. All right? So, this morning, we're going to be talking about the book of Esther. So, it's about 10 chapters long. So, this afternoon, go home and read it. But I'm going to hit the Cliff Notes version of this because Esther was someone who ties in very well with what we're talking about. And so I want to share some of these different things. And again, this is the Cliff Notes version of the book of Esther. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to turn to Esther chapter 1 and we're going to begin. Now, as you're turning there, I want to share something with you. Is there anybody else out there that's a skeptic? Anybody like to be a skeptic? You know, one of the things that I, when I was a teenager, I went through a period of time where I would probably have described myself as an agnostic. And the reason being is because I wasn't sure what I wanted to believe. And one of my problems was, 
I always had heard that somebody said to me, this is the word of God. And I said, okay, so how do you know that it's the word of God? Well, you need to use the word of God to show you that it's the word of God. Where now I understand that statement, at the time it seemed very circular reasoning. You need to use one source to prove the source that you're trying to prove. Sounds like circular reasoning to some degree. But here's what I love. I love history. And I love the fact that we now have scripture and history to put beside each other. And so as we talk about these, these people in the Bible, they're not just people in a story like some would want you to believe, but these are actual historical people that you can go back and research. And so as we start talking about Esther, the, one of the things that I love is Esther's husband is probably one of the most documented kings in all of the Persian Empire. So again, I can go study Esther's husband and see the side of the story as it's been told through history. So I will tell you, I am bad with names. So if I make up a name or it seems like I made up that name, chances are I did. If you, can, if you can provide biblical proof for how it's supposed to be pronounced, then come see me and we'll talk about it in my next sermon. I'll use it, all right? So until then, I'm going to use it the way I say it. Amen? All right. Esther chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Asherus, this was Asherus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Asherus sat on the throne of the kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all of his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. So, here's the thing. King Asherus is also known by another name. Does anybody know what that name is? He would have been known as Artaxerxes I. Here's the thing. We have three or four instances where this particular family connects back into the Bible. So they actually have quite a bit of history in the Bible. Now I will tell you there's actually been quite a bit of research done on Artaxerxes the first. There was even a Hollywood movie that came out about him. Has anybody ever heard of the movie 300 and the Battle of Thermopylae? That would have been Artaxerxes the first. So, bet you didn't know that that was Esther's husband. So here's the thing. As they were coming together and as they were this, this was a king. This was a ruler of the, media, of the Persians and the Medes. And this was a kingdom that stretched from India to Ethiopia. This was a man of power. This would later be overtaken by the Roman Empire. That's the size and the capacity in which we're talking about. This was somebody who had some power. So he threw this party for all of his leaders. And so during this party that they were having after this feast, as they had spent time, it was common when they partied, the men would party over here, and the women would party over here, and they could have an entire party without one ever crossing the other. However, in this particular instance, the king decided, I want to invite my wife to come over because I want to show the people who are here the beauty that is my wife. Men, you should talk about your wife like that, amen? I want to show the beauty that is my wife. 
So he called over and he said, what I want you to do is I want you to get all dressed up. I want you to put the crown upon your head and I want to show you off to all of my friends and the people that were underneath me. Well, as the story goes, Vashti said, no, not going to happen. And so, the king's ruler said, well, what do we do with her? I think the king was a little dumbfounded. I told her to come, and she didn't come. And in those days, you didn't tell a king no. It didn't happen. People had been killed for much less than that. And so, in this response, the king decides that, okay, I'm going to send her away. She will never come before me again. So he makes this proclamation. Queen Vashti is expelled. And then the king realizes he has a problem. Has anybody ever done something and then thought about it? And realized, maybe that wasn't the best decision I ever made in my life. Chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, after these things, when the wrath of King Asher is subsided, so after he got done being angry, he remembered Vashti. And what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So after he had done all of this, he began to miss his wife. And so all of his leaders and people came along said, and said, well, here's what we can do. We can't get you your old wife back, but we'll get you a new one. And so what happened was they went out and this decree was set forth that all that were eligible would come in and the king would then pick the wife of his choosing. So how do we get to Esther in this situation? Well, let's talk about this. Verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, and the son of Shemel, the son of Kish, and a a Benjaminite. And Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Je Jehoah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother. The young, the young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. To say the least, Esther, even up until this point, had not had an easy life. She had lost her own mother and father and had been living with her uncle. i make sure that's right. Yes, uncle. And so as, as she was living with him, they were in this place, and this decree comes forward, and of course, she's an eligible woman. She is lovely and beautiful. And so what happened was, she was brought to the temple, to the kingdom, and she was presented before the people and presented before the king. And of course, as we know from the story, that the king chose her as his wife. You know, I wonder if he saw in her something that he didn't see in anybody else. And I wonder if that thing that he saw in her 
was the working of God in her life. Because the Bible says that when he saw her, there was something that attracted to him. Something like no other woman. Chapter 2, verse 19. Again, this is the Cliff Notes version. It says, when the virgins were gathered together at the second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had revealed her family and her people just had not revealed her family or her people just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuch, Bigtham and Thresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Asherus. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when the inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now, here's what I love about this story. Even before Esther knew that she needed it, God was building credibility for her with the king. So when God asks you to do big things, understand that God has already did the work in you that is necessary to do those things. So sometimes people ask the question, well, why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? What are the circumstances? Sometimes God is preparing you for what is to happen in the future. And the influences and the experiences that you have today may be the tool by which God uses in the future for his glory. Amen? Because we have a God who sees the beginning from the end, and he sees these things, and he's lining things up. This didn't happen by chance. We can see in the life of Esther that God was preparing her for what she had to do. Then comes the ego. You know, if you ever took a psychology class, there's a name that comes up all over the place by the name of Sigmund Freud. Anybody ever heard of Sigmund Freud? And they talked about the ego. It's all about me. You know, I wonder if the biggest hindrance to God working in our lives is ourselves. Because I will tell you, ego will keep you from doing big things. You know, some of the people that I have met in my life that have done the most for the gospel are some of the most humble people you'll ever meet in your life. They don't care what their car looks like. They don't, look what, they don't care what their building looks like. They don't, look, they don't care what people think of them. They're just there to do what God has called them to do. But I'll tell you, the idea of ego can stand in the way of a lot of different things. Esther chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And it says, after these things, King Asherus promoted Haman, the son of Hamdatha, the agate, and advanced him and set him his seat above all princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see where, whether Mordecai's words would stand. 
For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Asherus, the people of Mordecai. This whole issue, this whole problem started with an issue of ego. I deserve to have people bow down to me. The king has placed me in a place of honor. This is deserved to me. And when God's people chose to follow God's word, the ego of Haman was injured. And so... The ego is something that's incredibly difficult and very easily manipulated. Verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8. Then Haman said to King Asherus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's law. See that feeding that ego? Your law, they don't follow your rules. And the people, they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasures. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the, ha the son of Hamdallah, the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. So this person was essentially the number two in the Persian Empire. And now the Jews really had a problem. Because the king not only had okayed it, but had given him the signet ring, which was the authority of the king. Haman could literally do whatever he wanted to at that point. I can understand why Mordecai would be a little afraid. And so now, we see Esther in this place where God has placed her in that location, has built credibility for her with the king, now having to do something big. Now, what Mordecai asked her to do was to go before the king. Now, in those days, you didn't do those things. You didn't go before the king. That was something that didn't happen if you did that and he didn't call you, you were a dead person. And so what happened was, as Esther went before the king, I'm sure every eye in the place turned and looked at her. And then it turned and looked at the king. Because the king was the one who would decide her fate at that moment. But God was faithful because the king reached out his scepter to her and allowed her to make the request of the king. Again, when somebody saves your life, they have credibility with you. And it's clear that the king loved his wife. And so when she asked this question, this favor of, would you come to dinner? The king's a smart man. You don't get to be king by being dumb. Well, you don't stay there. 
And so here's the thing. As, as he was listening to this, why would this woman, why would his wife risk her life to invite me to dinner? If she had wanted to, she could have said to one of the eunuchs to go ask the king's people to have him come to dinner. There was no reason for her to risk her life to do it herself. So, why then did she do it? So, have you ever felt like you're being set up? <laughs> that something's coming? Husbands, have you ever felt that way? So, as a husband, he knew that there was something more to this. He knew that his wife wanted something more than just to have dinner with him. So as they're sitting there eating dinner, him and the, ki the king and Haman, as they're sitting there at this feast that Esther prepared for them, I'm sure he's waiting for that, okay, this is what I want. It would be logical that he would assume that. And so when Esther comes back to him and says, if I have found favor, would you come a second time? Now he's really curious. When you expect one thing to happen and something else happens, it throws you for a loop. And he's going, all right, she put her life in jeopardy to ask me to go to dinner, to ask me to go to dinner again. Something doesn't quite make sense here. But I'm going to go to dinner. We're Okay, I get dinner. And so, as the story goes, it's at this second meeting that he had with Esther that Esther shares the fact that her life is in jeopardy and that Haman is the one who is putting him, putting her people at jeopardy. Here's the thing. It's not a matter of if God will ask you to do big things. It's a matter of when God asks you to do big things. How do we respond? First, when God asks you to do something that's big, or it scares you, or it's outside of your comfort zone, take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen? I guarantee you that night before Esther decided to step before the king, that there wasn't time for anything else other than prayer. She prayed. She fasted. As she waited... She sought God and asked God, is this really what you want for me? Are you really saying this to me? Or is it about me? That ego in there. Sometimes we want to do big things because it brings attention to ourselves. It brings attention to what I did. Esther could have said, I saved the Jewish people. I went for the king. But here's the thing. God did those things. So when God asks you to do something that just doesn't seem in the norm, if it's something that scares you, if it's big, if it's something that you don't know how to overcome, if it's something that seems impossible, first take it to God in prayer. That decision has to be bathed in prayer. Secondly, after God has spoken to you and said, this is what I want you to do, the next step is taking that step out in faith. Neil Armstrong 
as he was walking on the moon. He said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I guarantee you as Esther took that very first step in the door to the court of the king, that was a step of faith. That was a step to say that I trust God. That I am willing to do what God has asked me to do. And that I know that my God is faithful. I will tell you right now, church is very easy. I can come to church. I can listen to a sermon. I can sit in the pew. And then I go home. But what happens when God asks you to take your faith, your relationship with Him, and put it into action? What happens when God asks you to take that step that doesn't seem comfortable, that doesn't seem normal for you? Like I said, when we submit our will to the will of God, God will do incredible things. Are we prepared to God, for God to do that in our lives? So sometimes it requires that step of faith and saying, you know what? I know that my God is faithful. He's been faithful before. He's faithful today. And I know that he will be faithful tomorrow. Again, this happens after prayer. After you and God have privately fought this out and talked about this and understand what he's asking you to do, it requires a step of faith to say, I'm going to move forward. And I'm going to trust that God will do what he says he will do. Finally, the last step is this. Watch what God will do. Because here's what happens. So many times I think that it's you and I standing in the way of what God wants to do. God has made promise after promise of what he will do if we are faithful to the will of God. He has said over and over again, time and time again, these are the promises that you could have if you were to only claim the promises of God. Sometimes I believe we need to step out of the way and let God work. But God will never be found unfaithful. I'm learning as a Christian every day, that God is never late. Seldomly is he early, but God is always on time. He's there when I need him. And so as we talk about these things, when God asks you to do big things, understand that he planned this for you. He's already done the work necessary for you to do those big things in your life. He's had this plan all the way along. But what he's asking of you is simply this. First, take it to the Lord in prayer. Have a conversation about what God is asking you to do. And finally, after you've had that conversation, be willing to trust God at his word. That when I take that step of faith, that I will not be turned back to me void. But that God is faithful in all that he does. And finally, here's the exciting part. Watch what God will do with you. I've come to realize when I do things myself, it only goes so far. But when I submit my will to God, God will take me places I've never been before. 
God will do things that I didn't think were possible. He will open doors that were never available. I've seen, you know, people say sometimes God shuts a door in your life. I've seen God create a door out of thin air, if that's what's necessary. So this morning, it's not if God will ask you to do big things. It's when God asks you to do big things. How will you respond? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have used ordinary people to do incredible things. And Father, I know at this very moment that there are people in this place that you want to do incredible things with. Father, we pray that today, that it not be an ego that stands in the way, that it not be any of those things, but Father, that it be somebody who you placed, somebody that you've prepared, that they're willing to have that conversation with you, to understand the plan, but not only just to understand it, but to act on it, to, stay, to take that step forward and say, God, use me. Here I am. Send me. Take that step in faith. Trust that you are God. That you are in control. And even if I don't feel comfortable, or even if I don't feel like this is something I'm able to do, that Father, I know that you are able. And Father, I want to thank you for in advance that which you're going to do. You have promised that if the church is faithful, that you will be faithful to us. So Father, we pray as your people that we continue to seek your face. Turn from our ways. Seek your kingdom. Lead others to the cross. And ultimately, ever closer to you. Father, we thank you and we praise you in your wonderful son's name.